very much come for inviting us here and spending a little of your very valuable time with us uh, in Madness for Life. Um, we're here at the uh, Dubai National Duty Free Offices and you're one of the most distinguished sons of the town. Uh, I wonder would you share with us some of your fondest memories of growing up in Madness for Life? Uh, sure, well, yeah. Carl, you're very welcome. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Dubai. The, um, of course, I remember very well growing up at Banislow and my mum and dad's house was still there. So any time I go to Ireland, I pass by and visit the graveyard and visit the house. And I say to my wife, that's where I was when I was a baby. And I remember all these things very clearly. I remember also, of course, going to the National School. And I remember Matty Gantley teaching us in Gavali. I remember Pat Carney as head teacher. Um, and I remember various other things. I remember crashing my bicycle between somebody. I remember borrowing a bicycle outside the, the ball alley one time that wasn't mine, and I fell off it and broke my wrist. I remember going to the National School. I remember trying to learn the piano. I remember my father and mother ensuring that we learned Irish dancing. I remember taking part in the St. Patrick's Night's concert. Um, and, you know, I remember all the things from Derry Mullen where I come from. And uh, like anybody, I'll never forget them. I remember in the summertime going, going to the bog and cutting the turf. I remember buying my first bicycle. My father cut a lorry load of turf. He allowed me to save it, and then he allowed me to sell it. And I sold the lorry load of turf, which he did for me, for 14 pounds in those days, and I treated myself to a bicycle in petty clocks. Of course I remember it. <laughs> and for fun and games for young fellas of that generation in town, was it confined to the pictures and sport, or were there other avenues for you to dabble in culture and entertainment activities? Well, the pictures were a good thing, but you know, it was kind of a Sunday evening treat, and you had to be at least 12 or 13 before you were allowed to go. There was all the regimented things of, you know, going to Mass on Sunday morning, of course, and either walking or cycling to school. Um, we were always involved in saving the turf for the winter. We were involved in doing the garden and cutting the hedges. Um, and of course, that time also, the FCA used to have um, voluntary membership, if you like, and train young people how to be, how to march, how to be disciplined, how to do various things. Um, and then came the re the Bandeslaw relays. I remember were a very exciting thing. The St. Patrick's Day came, and then, of course, Tufts amusements during the October Fair. And all of these things were part and parcel of leading up to Christmas and starting a new year. Um, you were a garbly educated young man, and then you, uh, fortunes took you to London, uh, where you joined Woolworths. Talk us through your career from the London years. I sure will. I went to London for the summer of 1961. The purpose was to earn some pocket money. It was designated in my house that I would go back and join university and study dentistry. That summer turned into eight years, which I spent in London. I did various summer jobs when I first went there. And there used to be a big exit out of Ireland that time, and people would work on the building sites in Slough, just outside Heathrow Airport. I did various things. I worked in a farm in Ditcott. I worked in a hop farm in uh, Kent, in a place called Yaldine. And I sold encyclopedias door to door. I became a bus conductor. I became a house painter. And then I joined Woolworths. Like Brendan Bean was the yeah. house painter. <laughs> <laughs> I joined Woolworths as a trainee manager. Um, and my first assignment was to the store in Oxford Street which was the biggest store in the Metropolitan District at that time. And, um, and Woolworths were a big, successful retail company at that time. Um, and oddly enough, when I went through the training program, um, I returned to Woolworths in Oxford Street as the Deputy General Manager. And um, when I was there in the stock room, I used to cycle every day from Acton to Oxford Street. When I came back as Deputy General Manager, I had my own little car and was one of two people that could park under the building in a small car park. Um, and it was during that uh, time I was in Ireland on holiday 
Um, I saw a job advertised at the duty free at Shannon. I didn't really know what it meant. I went for interview. I was offered a job, and I decided to go home. And um, I joined the duty free in Shannon as that time the assistant manager. I subsequently became the manager, not because I was good, only because the previous manager was promoted. His name was Bill Maloney, mm -hmm. and uh, became a good friend of mine, and I'm still friends with him. And I spent 14 years in Shannon, mm -hmm. and after that time, the Irish government and the Dubai government did a contract to set up a duty-free at Dubai Airport. I was one of a team of 10 people who came here Pioneers. for six months. That was in 1983. During that time, I was asked if I would stay and run the operation. I retired and I did a contract to come to Dubai for two years. That two years is now in year 35. Um, so that's a summary of what you're asking. Can I just pull you back from what um, you received some accolades just before Christmas from the, um, the University of De was it Den Derby? Of uh, Middlesex. Middlesex, may I call them. And it was very um, noticeable that, as well as thanking your employers and the people of the, um, the Emirates and your staff for the accolade, uh, your, 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 your wife and children were mentioned and they were with you on the occasion. When did you meet the great club of your life? Was that in Shannon or in London? Or? That was in Shannon. All oh, right. Yeah, when I first went to Shannon. My wife, Rita, she's from Newmarket and Ferries in County Clare. Oh, she's a Clare girl. Okay. Yeah. And um, three children, the oldest of whom lives in Dubai, uh, the, the male of whom lives in Dubai. Uh -huh. He's the vice president of a company called Damac. And um, the two girls live in Brighton in England. And the youngest of them has two children. So you're a granddad? Yeah, I'm a granddad. 11-year-old and a 6-year-old. And in our, in our duty-free here at Dubai, it, uh, it's owned by the government. They are very positive and the, the enthusiasm that time appealed to me. I thought this has to be successful. Um, you, you didn't ask me, but we've grown up to become the largest duty-free operation in any airport in the world. I was, I was going to come to those yeah, figures. Sorry, yeah. I was going to come to those figures. 5,900 employees, 7.05 million UAE. Uh, I think it was your last year's posting of sales. You're the number one duty free in the world. To go from, I saw black and white photographs of the uh, the airport, the terminal building. It looked like, for all intents and purposes, Shannon in the 50s. And to come from that in 1983 to today, I mean, the foresight, the planning, the management. Where did the vision come from? Well, the government in Dubai are very positive. Okay. The ruler of Dubai, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed, nothing is impossible. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in 1983, the population of Dubai was about 250,000 people. Mm -hmm. It's now 3 million. The traffic through Dubai Airport in 1983 was 3 million passengers. The traffic last year was 88 million. And our first year in Dubai Duty Free, our business was sales of $20 million. We had 100 staff. I'm happy to say that we still have 27 of those 100 staff working for us. We have 260 staff who have done more than 20 years with us. We now have 5,900 staff. And we had a business last year of $1.93 billion. That's and, and to do that, I sometimes bore people by telling them, to do that, we sold 73 million pieces of merchandise last year. We did 27.1 million transactions on our registers. And we now have staff from 45 different nationalities. That's what um, I'm going and we're continuing, to, we're continuing to grow. I wanted to come to that. I, I've I've obviously read a little of some of the, um, the, the trade analysis and um, business and finance uh, articles on the phenomenon that is uh, success behind uh, Dubai International Duty Free. Uh, they, they reflect quite a few commentators that the staff complement of over 40 nationalities around the world makes you almost like the UN workforce of the, <laughs> the, the airport uh, industry. Um, what was it from either Ariantha or from um, uh, the London experiences or perhaps the Bangladesh experiences 
that allowed a cluster led by yourself of, of Irinda, I believe, uh, pioneers, to engage and to keep the commitment of those different nationalities, different cultures, different approaches to work, different approaches to customer relations, to, to find a glue to keep them all together, to keep them all motivated and happy to stay. We, we have a policy, and it's not just we at Divide Duty Free, it is the attitude of the government. Firstly, everybody is equal, and like 85% of the population of Dubai are from overseas countries. Um, we change a little bit the staff mix depending on the traffic that comes through the airport. Mm -hmm. If you look, for example, 15 years ago, we did not have any Chinese staff. We now have 693 Chinese staff because of the change in, in traffic. The, um, it's part and parcel of you know, the cosmopolitan attitude of the, of the United Arab Emirates that it has to be all these different nationalities. Um, the, I don't want to say order, but the policy is that they work closely together. And we have found in the duty free that that works very, very well. And um, all our staff are treated equally. There are no obligations to have a certain number of this nationality or a certain number of that nationality. We have four Irish from the Dubai Duty Free. <laughs> um, and we treat our staff well. So our retention has been very good. Cool. Our staff turnover last year was 6.3%, which is very, very low. And it has been consistently that for the past number of years. Well, I want to ask you, Colin, if I may, um, you're in a unique position, uh, both by uh, breadth of career and contacts and knowledge base within the industry. Um, what for you are the uh, trends in, in global tourism, or what do you see coming down the tracks next? Who's the next um, group of travellers that are going to knock us all in the Western world? Or, or what are, the, are people looking for longer haul destinations with shorter time lapses? Are they looking for more exotic destinations? Do they want to travel with less luggage? What, looking into that crystal ball with what you've achieved and what you know, what can we be positive about? What, sorry, what can we futuristically look at that's going to happen in the next decade or so for growth and for global tourism in particular? I do think short stay is going to become more and more popular. I do think people want to travel with less luggage. They want to be available to, you know, want to be free to do different things and do them easily. The um, different parts of the world produce different things. The current big rage, of course, is Chinese traffic. And if you look at Dubai Duty Free's business, and the Chinese traffic through Dubai Airport accounts for about 4% of the traffic, they account for 8 to 9% of our Dubai Duty Free business. There were 450,000 Chinese visitors overnighters to Dubai two years ago. Last year it was 660,000. The tourism and traffic in to Dubai, and I think this can be reflected in every country, last year there were 15.7 million visitors into Dubai. And that's steadily growing. You know, 10 years ago it was maybe 6 million. And the projection here, and I rarely, I've rarely seen projections that are wrong, projection in Dubai that by 2020 there will be 22 million visitors into Dubai. And that means, of course, extra hotels are required, extra buildings are being done, extra accommodation, transport. You know, in 2009, Dubai opened the most modern metro system in the world. There's a fantastic taxi service, there's a fantastic transport service, there's big ro roadways, highways, underpasses, overpasses. It all has to stay developing together. I, I was making the point to you uh, earlier in our chat that your, your late dad, uh, Thai, who is still uh, revered and um, well regarded uh, by a great many people in East Galway, Bangaslow, had a great sense of um, his store, uh, uh, local store, not, not over heritage, but he had a tremendous gift uh, to being a, as involved as he was in so many cultural, sporting, and uh, historical associations and activities and clubs. And one of the things that struck me coming into the heart of the operation here at the corporate quarters was the amount of giving um, that uh, the Dubai company here is now involved in. And you seem to have a very attuned sense of corporate social responsibility. And unlike other great brands, uh, or worldwide recognized brands that I've 
previously been studied. There seems to be a genuine connectivity between uh, your staff and management, your customer, and what uh, a, few, uh, a few significant investments can do for those less, need, less well off for us or those who, who require our support in society. Do you think that's something that your parents instilled in you that was an easy value to transmit to uh, the company and the management here, or why did that come about? Was it so strong? I, I think, yes, I did see it at home. I did see my dad, you know, um, for many years try to do various things, and he was instilling it in us whilst we were young people. Um, now, it wasn't new to hear either. There has been a giving attitude in this part of the world for many, many years. Parts from this part of the world, finance has created thousands of water wells all over the world, for example. So it wasn't unique that the Vajra Degree set up its own foundation. I had the full support of my chairman, His Highness Sheikh Ahmed, to do that. He approved that we could transfer a certain amount of our top line sales every year into financing the foundation. We created within the Duty Free a department which deals solely with CSR and staff safety. We enthused our staff and we generally don't talk too much about the foundation, but we have supported 78 different charities. We have several, ch several children of special needs in schools. We pay the fees of school teachers in autism schools in Dubai. And for many, many years, we have supported the Jack and Jill Foundation in Ireland um, with a charitable donation. We have a board and we get many requests and we look at them and assess them. And all our staff are very, you know, sometimes through this department, we put our, ask the, our staff to put their hands up and volunteer. We might get 90 staff volunteer to go and clean the beach. Uh, and sometimes during the year, we have our staff walking around the roads here, cleaning up refuse from the roads, if anybody. So there is an attitude in Dubai, but also in Dubai Duty Free, to help other people. Okay. And we have received several awards, awards in the Duty Free for that sort of operation. I think we're counting about 600 different awards at the moment for, for our operation, but some of which are corporate social responsibility recognition. I, I'm struck as well, kind of, you were privileged, I suppose, to be um, um, working with Brenda Regan, who was a great visionary in the Shannon region for what, an airport and a planned town and a planned industrial zone around it could do for the Midwest, and it certainly boosted the fortunes of the Atlantic seaboard from the, the late 50s right through to, I suppose, the early 90s. And you've seen here, uh, you've mentioned some of the top line figures, the growth in a, what was a regional, effectively, airport mm -hmm. in the 50s to become a world leader today. Um, our state has had, I suppose, a, a checkered history in creating significant planning opportunities or, or making plans that allow people to engage in economic activity. And there's a, a little bit of a debate going on now government circles and in the media at home about what type of plan the island needs for further economic development and whether we invest, continue to invest in Dublin or whether it's spread out throughout the cities and then what role provincial towns such as Ballinasloe may have in a plan like that. And coming back to the town and visiting it, we don't have a manufacturing base that we used to have in the 70s and 80s. Um, we're more service, we're more, more of a commuter town. What do you think the future might hold for towns like Manuslow in the next, you know, two decades or decade and a half, if, if you have a view? I think um, provincial towns and rural towns in Ireland have great potential. I've often wondered about Manuslow if the river still couldn't be used better from the point of view of tourism. Um, I know these motorways bypass towns. I think that's not always a bad thing. I think very often it's a good thing. Um, I know we have our Dubai Duty Free logo on the Bicycle Club in Bannonslow. The, um, I think tourism, I think Ireland made a great comeback after the, the crash or the bad times of 2007-2008. Ireland were lauded all over the world as being one of the first countries in Europe to pay back debt and they did it very, very admirably. And I think Ireland have got a lot of things right. If you take here, in, in the UAE. There was no such thing here as an Irish embassy 12 years ago, 
and whilst we were agitating for it, it was being looked at. And now there's a very active embassy in Abu Dhabi. Um, Enterprise Ireland have an office here, Tourism Ireland have an office here, Board B have an office here. And I think Ireland had to do that in more and more countries and boost the exports. But that's not specifically the question you asked me. I think rural towns have to be developed more. It is nonsense if a city like Dublin just gets so congested that people cannot work properly there, have to spend hours travelling to work, cannot afford to live there. So I think all of the manufacturing industry has to be spread out a little bit. You, you know, I know about Dublin, Cork and Galway, Limerick, busy places, but let's find something for Banislow. Let's re-enact the cross story. story when it happened and just very successful for a while and then it died away. Um, but I, I'm sure there's potential for those. I, 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 let's put cruisers on the Shannon. Let's put little boats. Do, do um, dinners every night. Have 20 people on the boat. I'm smiling ruefully. I chatted with the late, great Rory Cadoff on Main Street oh, okay. about two years before his demise. And he was in robust form sitting inside the stove. But he was reflecting on the fortunes of the town. And uh, he too was familiar with the 80 Cross story. And he stopped me in my track because he said, now Croffy, the only thing that ever came to town was the circus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what? the activity that used to be there around the, the, the October Horse Fair, for example, we'd have we'd go into the bumper cars and toss amusements. And, uh, that still goes on. You know, yeah, still goes on but maybe it should be repeated a few times in the year. Well, with Galway's uh, City of Culture status now for 2020, there might be some impact from that. We, we, we'll see. I want to just quickly ask you, um, you You've trained a lot of people, you've mentored a lot of people, you've interviewed a number of people, I'm sure, for mid-management positions, for senior management positions, in a variety of, not just here, I'm sure, other airport boards and stuff. What sort of career advice would you give to young people in balanced all There's two, two secondary schools with over 1,200 students, who 60 to 70% of whom will go for third level education and do four years of some degree program. I mean, you mentioned from meat packing to pushing peas into a, into a drum and emptying the tea chests as they arrived into Oxford Street. Um, you know, and, and now here you are. Most young people today come wouldn't believe that you can go from those sort of jobs to this type of position, to have the, the career that you've had. What five, four or five pieces or nuggets of advice would you give to a young 18, 19 year old? Today? Whenever I'm asked this, you know, in uh, training things or that, um, the first thing I always answer is that as you progress up the ladder, you must be loyal to your staff. Um, it's proper that all staff at all levels are treated the same. Divide your degree introduced to think 18 years ago of internal promotion only, so we haven't recruited senior people from outside our own company in that time. We've trained them in-house and, and you know, offered the jobs to them. I think very simply, and I always say that what's important is that you work hard, you work honestly, you treat people equally. And I might be totally wrong on this, but I also say to people, do not get overawed or totally dependent on technology. Um, your company has to be modern and quick, and you know, we have to handle 75,000 transactions every day, and we have to be technically up top to do that. But from a personal point of view, if you watch people going around pulling out iPhones, doing this, doing that, when they should be talking to somebody, it's nonsense. And I often say to people, I'm fortunate that I run the biggest duty-free operation in the world. That's 12 years old, and that's what I use. <laughs> but for a, for, for a mum or a dad who's watching this heavy, uh, the, the debate you hear at home is that we're weak in languages. We need more foreign languages to be studied. We have very few people in, in Ireland who speak Mandarin fluently, who understand some of the, the, the Arabic languages, or who would understand any of the South African languages, or um, Portuguese, and that these are going to, or even Russian, and that these are going to be some of the, the new growth markets, the BRICS, the Brazil, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And is that something that you think would, would impact negatively on Irish kids as they go forth and that become the new retailers, the new marketeers, and the new industrialists of the new age. Ka Nia Hao. That's something I learned for the Chinese New Year. It's Happy New Year. 
<laughs> and I do. <laughs> it's uh, not like Gambe. Kanya how? Kanya how? I think if people can speak other languages, it's fantastic. I think it should be concentrated on. It's not essential by any means, but I think it's a big plus. We, and that is why we in the Baidu degree employ um, a lot of Moroccans because they speak, they speak Arabic, a lot of Chinese because they speak Mandarin, and so on. Our staff, you didn't ask me this, but our staff speak 29 different languages. The reason we have 693 Chinese staff working for us is, is the build up in Chinese traffic and the requirement that they converse and, and look after the customers instead. And um, we have various in-house programs to help our staff doing this. I do think um, languages are, are a big benefit to people, although not essential. I would like to send greetings to everybody in Ballinasloe, but it is a long time ago since I left there. I actually left Ballinasloe in 1961. A few years ago, in 2014, I was very flattered to be invited to officially open the October Fair. And of course, I want to send greetings to Mary Phelan and to um, her colleagues for having invited me to do that. Brendan Kelly, who I met on a subsequent visit to Dubai and very kindly provided the, the Kels, which is the Irish Hurling and Football Society in Dubai with some hurling balls, otherwise we call them the slitters. And I want to greet them. I want to greet my cousin, Brendan Cullen, and his wife Anne, who have visited Dubai in the past and who hosted me, in fact, during my visit to Banislow. And of course I'd like to recognize and greet, in fact, the people who looked after my parents for a long time, some years ago. Noni Burke, um, who is still very good friends with my sister Mira, and Carmel Murray. Thank you, Carmel. And I'm sad to hear that uh, Francis Burke, who was one of the three sons, has since passed away. But in summary, I'd like to greet everybody in Banislow and wish them well in all their future endeavors.